Good morning, Ellen, and welcome to the Low Carb Paleo Show. Thank you so much for having me here. I appreciate the invite. It's our pleasure for sure. And uh, Mark, how are you doing today? Wonderful, thank you. Enjoying the uh, French sunshine as usual. Yeah, does it feel different than the British sunshine? Oh yes, it's uh, it's got a, it's got a much better um, je ne sais quoi, one could say. Uh, Helen, you are a motivational speaker, personal trainer, running coach, author, and instructor of healthy cooking class. And you are vegan. Uh, what a surprise. So your friend Miyoko suggested we talk to you, and there you are. So talking about your background, um, can you tell us your story before uh, you became all of these uh, different personalities about well, the first part of it really began when I was five years old. Um, my aunt, seriously, died of breast cancer in our home, and it was really traumatic. And then my mom and both sisters would go on to have breast cancer. We became part of the original breast cancer gene studies. And even though we didn't need uh, any study to tell us what we already knew, that the gene was alive and well in our family. And I began living my life because doctors said, uh, when I almost died of a, a colon blockage at the age of 28, you better do some things differently or you're gonna end up like everybody else in your family. And every one of them had, in addition to the breast cancer, uh, the men as well as the women had um, heart disease, diabetes, and a lot of arthritis and Alzheimer's. Uh, there were four cases of Alzheimer's. So I lived my life as if I had the gene. And did, I was a TV investigative reporter, and I took every opportunity I could to interview doctors and dietitians, sort of with my own little agenda about what is the truth about food. And mm -hmm. I became a financial consultant at Smith Barney for five years. And then after I left, uh, and that was you know, following 18 years in TV news, getting two Emmys and the National Press Club Award for my investigative reporting, um, then I... Um, became a media consultant and called up the president of one of the most influential organizations at the time and still is in the U.S. called Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. It's a group of doctors and dietitians who, like me, were trying to figure out the truth about food. So I did media training for them and then became part of their cooking program as a trained instructor to teach their classes. And that's where, uh, during that six years, I cooked up my own idea to start writing my own books. Okay, so uh, you've been vegan since that time, since very early on, or was it a change, a later change? Um, I, my progression was, and this is fairly common with people my age, I went macrobiotic, then vegetarian, and then vegan. I was vegan before I got married. Once I had three, my three daughters, I became a La Leche League leader, which is in uh, the international organization that focuses on uh, breastfeeding information and support and because again I had doctors telling me even before I was married that breastfeeding could possibly be preventative against breast cancer not only in the mom but in female offspring as well so I did that for six years as well and then when I finished doing it uh, or, or during the time actually the cookbooks that La Leche League recommended once a baby was weaned from its own species milk uh, they recommended drinking milk from another species, which as mm. I look back on it was kind of a disconnect. But <clears throat> breastfeeding is so controversial. Their, their issue always was we don't want to mix causes. And indeed, I worked in a city and lived in a city, St. Louis, Missouri, where a woman was arrested for breastfeeding uh, her own child in a parked car in a shopping mall parking lot. So, mm. so many of these issues are connected, but it's like you know, connecting the dots is certainly a challenge. Madness. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in many ways, America is behind the curve, but it's getting better. Um, in Europe, it's never been a problem, but no, no. here it's much more Puritan. So, um, so tell me about your books. Um, how many do you have now? I have six out, and wow. uh, people say, "Wow, how do you write a book a year?" And and this year, I've actually written two. <laughs> so. I worked as a television reporter in Des Moines, Iowa, and I always say I used to do six stories a day in Des Moines. So if I can do that uh, with a very heavy camera on my shoulder, uh, a book a year is a luxury. But this is my first book, Eat Vegan on $4 a Day. 
And what makes it unique is that every single recipe in here has an estimated price right up here in the corner based on ingredients you can find at any big box store. And as a financial consultant, you know, I just got so tired of hearing these stories on the news that say, uh, and still do say, you can't eat well on a budget. I've done this for the better part of 35 years, and um, it's been really important uh, for me to uh, do this in a way that is consistent with my background as well. So I felt it was really important to just kind of put it out of the, the universe that it is not expensive to eat a vegan or a plant-based diet. And it's not only what you save at the store, it's what you save by avoiding doctors and diseases. And certainly that's been my way I've lived my life. I also do this crazy running. Um, that kind of started by accident. I really hate running. But I have placed in 118 5K or longer races for my age group since 2006, as I like to say, just on plants. Mm -hmm. And um, I ranked uh, third in the U.S. in the National Senior Games a couple of months ago in the 4x100 meter relays and fifth in the 800 meters, seventh in the 1500 and the 400. And I've done a couple of marathons and half, uh, nine half marathons just to, you know, stay in shape. So you get plenty of energy, plenty of protein, and uh, people always ask vegans, where do you get your protein? And we always say the same place your protein gets its protein. And, uh, <laughs> hey, you uh, cut out the middleman. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so that's Eat Vegan. Uh, do you want me to go through the other five books? Yes, yes, okay. please. All right, so the second child was this one, Kitchen Divided. Uh, vegan dishes for semi-vegan households, because a lot of people, I started asking them, how many of you live in mixed marriages where one of you is plant-based and the other isn't? And lots of people rolled their eyes and like angst set in. So that book deals with getting recipes organized in a way. It's your main course, uh, the meat eater's side dish, or maybe it's their main course and they can plop in whatever meat they want to. It, it, the idea is to streamline the cooking process so that if you as a vegan are charged with cooking for everybody, you don't lose your mind and uh, you know, it kind of makes it, uh, it simplifies the whole process. So that was book number two. Then book number three, um, as a runner, I was starting to hear about six or seven years ago about the paleo craze and I forced myself to read the meat-based paleo books and it seemed to me, because I've done all these diets and I've read all the books, it was like Atkins, the South Beach diet, the Zone diet all over again. And, um, you know, I lost weight on those diets, but my cholesterol shot up from being, uh, you know, vegetarian at, at 130 to 203 to the point where doctors were ready uh, in my 40s to put me on Lipitor. So um, there's heart disease in my family and that was a big red flag. So, you know, many vegans have had zigzags throughout their life and I was certainly one of those because the Atkins diet enjoyed uh, a resurgence in the late 90s and Atkins was on the Larry King show and there was a story in the New York Times about what if it was a big fat lie and, um, you know, I believed that the science had changed. What I felt to be the case later in, in hindsight was that the, uh, the marketing had changed. But I wanted to write paleo vegan. And in here I have, uh, for those people who want to do paleo but do it vegan style, there's actually a page here where I have some of the main foods that are common to both the vegan and the paleo diet, but 100% vegan again, so that if people want to do the paleo diet vegan style, they can. And interestingly enough, National Geographic came out with a cover story about a year after paleo vegan came out. It was called the real paleo diet. And I show this in my slideshows, but I have like 12 sticky notes where they almost quoted verbatim right out of the book, basically saying they called the current meat-based paleo books a stew of misconceptions. Uh, they said that the planet can't sustain a diet based around meat and dairy. And the third thing, the main point was the success rate of the real hunter gatherers was abysmal. There's only two hunter tribes left in Africa today and their success rate going out once every two weeks is about 50%. So it's really thought that in true Paleolithic times about a million years ago to the start of agriculture that the success rate was not very good. Um, so there's that. So it was really gratifying to see um, their cover story uh, 
you know, the real paleo diet since there was no Instagram back then. And, and there is some DNA evidence that some of these tribes actually were consuming um, certain kinds of grains and some uh, legumes as well to the extent they existed back there. So back during those times. So that was book so number. So when, uh, when, you, when you mention success rate, you mean survival rate, right? The success rate of being able to actually capture an animal uh, that was, you know, running through their backyard. They were able to, you know, now they have more sophisticated tools like arrowheads, spears, that kind of thing. Um, but it's thought that in true Paleolithic times that uh, it was pretty primitive. So it wasn't like a wild boar in today's times is running through our backyard. I mean, I did do a lot of research and force myself to read the meat-based paleo books. And, um, you know, they do make this assumption that we should be eating some kind of meat almost three times a day. And that just... No, no, that is not true. That is not true. Uh, the small amount of uh, protein, all we need is four to six ounces a day. And that's it. Now, the people that eat too much eat meat, that's their problem. But we should not... Uh, you know, see the paleo diet as uh, just people gorging themselves with meat. That's not the case. Well, one of the things I also found is there are a ton of paleo books out there, many of them written by self-appointed gurus. Um, within the vegan universe, a number of doctors, cardiologists are writing books, and I didn't really find that in the whole paleo thing. You know, and it's been, I wrote this book, um, three years ago. So, you know, it's been a while since I have read the current books. Um, I have not read any current meat-based paleo books, but certainly the ones I read, they had, uh, uh, especially the more popular ones, had the concept of a 20% cheat because they understood that a high-protein diet was not sustainable uh, for the long term, especially for athletes, that athletes definitely do need more carbs especially if you're going to be running like marathon. Right, right. As, as usual, any kind of diet is going to be hardcore people that will go to excess. But as, right. that is not the current trend. The current trend is much more, um, I wouldn't say laid back, but it's much more reasonable. And besides eating too much protein, animal protein is not good for you anyway. So, Right, um, and the USDA has cut back uh, here in the States. It's recommended amounts of daily intake of protein because people were getting kidney disease, and um, it was catching up with them in ways that were documented when Atkins started his whole thing. But, uh, you know, I understand that the current paleo focus is very different from the high-protein diets of the 1970s. So can you explain uh, what makes your book paleo-vegan? How do you make it paleo? Well, I um, looked at foods that were around before the start of agriculture. So um, because so many of the books I read at the time did allow for the concept of a cheat, we separated the book into what we would call a more strict paleo definition, which does not include um, beans and grains. The, mm. the cheat chapter, and you know, I, I fly a lot on book tour almost every weekend. Invariably, I'll sit next to somebody who is on the paleo diet, and I'll go, "So, what do you do for your cheat?" And they'll kind of giggle and go, "Ice cream and alcohol." So, my belief for a cheat for vegans: if you want to do beans and grains, and they don't bother you, and it's not an issue for you, uh, twenty percent of the time, it's that's better than ice cream and alcohol. But uh, for doing it in a more strict way. Um, obviously, just cutting out the beans and the grains you know, for whatever reasons, and people have different issues with different things, and so it's a very um, uh, pretty much gluten-free way of, of eating. And, you know, it is 100% vegan, so it's not going to include the meat, but um, right. nuts and seeds would be the basis for protein. And, of course, every fruit and vegetable, even a banana, has a gram of protein, and that's the real big issue. There's a great book out by a doctor, a vegan doctor called Proteinaholic. And, um, you know, we are so focused on the protein and certainly our Paleolithic relatives survived different ways. And it was really what was just available in their own environment. You know, in Northern climes, all they had access to mainly were more of the, the fish and the wild game. But in the more tropical climes, they had an abundance of plants as National Geographic pointed out. Right, right. Um, for me, my cheat is um, corn chips. And uh, once in a while, I do eat lentils because I found that it's necessary for uh, transit. Yeah. Right. 
but otherwise, I'm I'm pretty I'm pretty good at you know no grains, no beans, um, and um, I don't eat ice cream, but I, I I take sorbet once in a while, which you know technically is not paleo, but you know, it's fruit. Okay, it's a fruit. It's it's a fruit. This Frozen is no fruit. judgment zone here. Uh, mm -hmm. But what's fascinating to me is I, you know, work out quite a bit. I belong to gyms and I even went to a CrossFit gym, which here in the U.S., they are very correlated and connected into the paleo diet. So much so that when you check in at the front desk, they have these big canisters of whey protein. And I'm going like, wait, you know, in paleolithic times, we did not have anybody stomping around on olives to squeeze out the oil or to extract this, the fluids from another species and put it in a powder form. So, you know, I, I just kind of get amazed at, at these different exceptions. Um, before we go jumping back into the whole paleo thing real quickly, I'll just finish up on the books here. Um, Vegan Fitness for Mortals was my fourth one just because of my athletic record. And, you know, I'm often on these fitness panels around the country where I'm the only female. Um, and, and certainly I am without a doubt the oldest. I'll be 65 in November. And I just did a panel at the Raleigh Durham Veg Fest here in the States. And um, there were all these 20, 30 something guys, bodybuilders and uh, ultra marathoners, you know, just little old Ellen here who's just kind of cranking it out. And for me, the reason I wrote Vegan Fitness is because women who were beating me like crazy 10 years ago in 5K races, they aren't even running anymore. Meat eaters tend to get arthritis, vegans tend not to. It's a very anti-inflammatory diet. And when I've competed at the National Senior Games, I keep hearing more and more women my age and older kind of tapping me on the shoulder. They see me wearing a vegan shirt and they go, me too, because they're really getting this message. Um, that it's just, you, you get such energy from it and uh, the arthritis is kind of non-existent. So finish without injury, that's a big message of mine. And then um, the, the fifth and most controversial book is Vegan Sex. Uh, dump okay. your beds and uh, jump in bed because what's good for the heart is good for other parts. And you can talk about that if you want. And then the final book, book number six, Vegan for One, because more and more people are living alone. And so that book has servings of uh, one to two. So there's not so much wasted food. So that's Vegan for One. And they're all books except for a couple, a uh, hundred recipes in each book, no overlap. Right. Great, great. Sounds great. Um, Let's go back to the the subject that interests everybody: sex. So tell us more about the. <laughs> well, you know, sex sells, right? Um, so, so what what makes uh, so? Yes, I understand the 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 idea of uh, keep your heart healthy and and all the other parts will stay healthy. Um, um, more specifically, um, can you elaborate a little more? Yeah, so even mainstream doctors will say to patients, if you have erectile dysfunction, this is the canary in the coal mine and we need to maybe look at your heart. Because what happens is the arteries and the vessels are smaller in that part of the body than they are in, in, uh, around the, the heart. And so the smaller vessels clog up first and give you that first warning signal that something may not be right. And um, I experienced this painfully myself with my ex-husband uh, who was not vegan and didn't would not say that he had heart disease even though he was on Lipitor and uh, blood thinners and blood pressure medicine and sure enough um, had a one, a one hour from death uh, almost fatal heart attack and um, it was just so sad because he wasn't really willing to look at this. And cardiologists around the country uh, have gone to these different workshops put on by different medical institutions. And the cardiologists really get this big time um, that you can, Dr. Coldwell Esselstyn has written a book, Reversing Heart Disease. And a lot of the work that he's done has inspired many of these other cardiologists to get out there. There's Dr. Terry Cook, who is the head of medical services for Cook County in Chicago. And he runs around the country, and I've seen him doing this. It's amazing. He's a urologist by training, and he shows the surgery he does of penile implant surgeries. And he said every man in America or the world ought to be required to see this because when you clog up your arteries with cholesterol and, uh, and plaque, 
um, this is your life and this is this is what will happen so mm -hmm. the, the converse for me is uh, I, I hope it's okay to say this and you'll just have to tell me if I'm getting beyond the G rating here but mm -hmm. um, I was a 62 year old vegan virgin I had not had an experience um, with a vegan until that age and every single partner I had up until then had erectile dysfunction and we all hmm. just thought it was part of life you know give me the blue pill it may or may not work but you know there's really nothing we can do it's just the aging process well hmm. once uh, I had a vegan partner. The difference was so astounding. It's kind of like vegans sometimes feel this joy when they first go vegan because they feel good and energized. And then they get like angry, like why didn't a doctor suggest this before they cracked open my heart or did these other invasive procedures? And for me, it was the same reaction. It's like, why didn't a doctor tell one of my partners to go vegan? And in fact, uh, since then, I actually have uh, been with another partner who was not vegan when we met, and I got him to go vegan 95% of the time. And he had thought he couldn't have uh, sex for 30 years. And when mm -hmm. we met, he got a prescription of Viagra, and I'll just leave it at this to say he did not need it, and he was mm -hmm. so blown away um, by the difference. So, he, and he's written, he wrote a section of the book too about his own experience. And, and it's not only the, it's not only the physical reaction, but it, it's also the emotional connection that you get because the whole thing about being vegan for animals is that when you are not consuming them three times a day, you realize that you are eliminating, at least in a tiny way, some animal suffering or, you, or you're not paying someone else to go out and do the kinds of things that you wouldn't do. Like you wouldn't kill your dog or your cat to be on your plate. And we actually know now that pigs are smarter than dogs. So people are making these connections for animals in very big ways. It's not just the diet, uh, as people like to say now. It's, it's really um, a lifestyle. Can we, can we talk about the feminine side of things? Uh, how does it benefit women uh, to be vegan on the sexual side because uh, it's obvious with the men but it's not so obvious with women so how do you know well i write about this extensively in the book because if if we have time i'll just share this experience because so many women have thanked me for sharing it so you know i'm plodding along uh, doing my life and running and i had some back pain and so the doctor sends me to you know, we said we can't really find anything, but you may have a prolapsed uterus. That sometimes happens as you age, the bottom falls out. So they sent me to a physical therapist who specialized in pelvic floor issues for both men and women. So she did this internal exam like no other physical therapist I've ever had. And she said, and again, you got to stop me if we get too graphic here, but um, she said, you have atrophied. Because my partners had erectile dysfunction, my internal muscles and the vaginal walls and that whole department had just gone to sleep. So her prescription, U.S. medical insurance paid for this, was a dildo. She said, I don't <laughs> want you to use it for the purpose of achieving anything. I want you to use it for massaging those internal muscles that need to get blood flow into the area. Mm -hmm. So um, when I got divorced and then it was going to be apparent that I was going to be having an experience with a vegan. Um, I told her about it and she says, oh, it's going to be awful. It's going to be painful. At the age of 62, you need to have lubric lubricants. So I stocked up on three different kinds of lubricants and trotted uh, to this location. And the short story is I didn't need a thing. Vegans are eating lots of fruits and vegetables that have water in them and stimulate the production of healthy hormones. And, you know, the commercial that says the, the erectile dysfunction commercials, I don't know if they have them in the UK, uh, that say, you know, if you have an erection lasting four hours, call your doctor. Uh, <laughs> do they not have those commercials? <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I don't know. I don't know. I'm sure. I'm sure okay. they do. I'm yeah, sure they well, do. Anyway, so I never point, watch those commercials. It's a good thing. But my response is call me. Um, because <laughs> for a woman, you are equally lubricated and the blood flow is fabulous and you can feel and sense your partner. So mm. I actually have a section in here on simultaneous 
can I say the word? Uh, simultaneous experiences. Okay, you guys are not right. stopping me. You mean orgasm? Yes. You mean orgasm? Simultaneous That's okay. Yes. We're, all, we're all adults here, right? Okay. This is not a kiddie show. Okay, um, I just don't know where this is airing, but uh, anyway. The, yes, it's true. You, you know that, uh, you know, you can't blame cholesterol for everything. You know, uh, most black is created by inflammation. And this and inflammation is due to certain kind of foods we eat, certainly, but not always protein. So, uh, for example, a lot of vegan eat a lot of grains and a lot of beans, and that's inflammatory. Or so how do you... Yeah, yeah and the nightshade. So... Um, is your paleo vegan book more geared toward anti-inflammation or less grains and beans than the other cookbooks? Absolutely, it is. And, um, you know, as I say, I'm a certified personal trainer and different things work for different people. And you right. have to figure out what works for you. I think a lot of people, especially if they're aerobically fit and doing the whole running thing like I am, like, like I am they can get away with all kinds of stuff. Like I know uh, runners who are way younger than I am, not vegan, you know, and they'll be posting on social media, them eating donuts and all kinds of stuff after they run. Mm. It's like, it's an insurance policy, they think. Um, and, but conversely, a vegan diet does not cure flat feet. I've been working on that one. And it may mm. not cure erectile dysfunction and it may not reverse heart disease, but a lot of times it can make great inroads depending on your body. And you just have to be your own experiment. I mean, after six decades here, I have definitely experimented a lot. And, um, you know, when, when I was young, you'd go to your doctor and complain about a weight problem, and they would put you on amphetamines for two weeks. And I've run into many women my age in the States who have had that experience. So we've learned right. so much, and you just have to see what works for you. Right. For the record, I'm 65, and I've never used a blue pill. Awesome. Mm. And I'm paleo. <laughs> and I have reference to prove it in case you need them. Uh, awesome. Moving on, uh, what other service, services do you offer to your clients? Um, well, I, because I am a certified personal trainer, uh, it doesn't allow me to act as a dietitian or a healthcare professional in any way, but I can request a three-day food log and see, you know, make recommendations. And, you know, people will always say, as I'm sure you know, oh, yeah, I eat so healthy. And then when they give you the food log, it's like it's kind of sheepish and they go, uh, well, maybe not so much. So there's mm -hmm. that. Um, I found it, that uh, people are much more, much less likely to let you read a food blog than their bank account. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 It's 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 amazing. I mean, uh, I've had clients who I had to fight with because they either they don't want to do it at all or they at which case I say, okay, then we have nothing to do with each other. Or they'll cheat. And I said, if you want me to help you you have to be honest. And I'm not here to judge. I'm here to do the detective and let you know what you should take out of your diet to improve. Right. And especially if people are paying you, you know, yeah. they need to get their money's worth and it's not going to help yeah. them. If they aren't being right. straight. You're absolutely right. The other thing I do because of this amazing technology that we're now using, um, I can act as a, I mean, I am a certified personal trainer, so we can develop a program using just weight or body weight um, to uh, for people who don't want to go to a gym for whatever reason. And mm -hmm. I can see their form. They can see my form as I demonstrate uh, the, the proper form. So that's another thing right. I do. And then there's vegan mm -hmm. lifestyle coaching as well. Okay, cool. So uh, uh, you also, do you uh, particularly train athletes or you just regular people? Um, all ages. I mean, I've done, uh, I was a, a high school volunteer uh, track and field coach. So um, I've done running clinics, that kind of thing. Uh, when I travel around the country, I do cooking demonstrations. And uh, I usually closed out my Q&A sessions doing a plank contest. And I am proud to say that I have won almost every plank contest I've done, except this past weekend, these uh, 20, two 20 something bodybuilders uh, lasted, uh, outlasted me. Um, but my record is six and a half minutes. <laughs> So, what, what is that? Uh, a plank what? where you, you know, you're on your elbows and you're on the ground in a plank position. 
Okay. It's like, uh, well, I could demonstrate it if you want me to, or <laughs> I might lose no, we the don't. We, we don't have to, to go that far now. Uh, okay. So it's similar to um, like a yoga pose? Yes, yes. But you are, uh, a lot of people do it with their arms straight up, like the extended push-up position. Okay. But uh, if you're doing it for longer periods of time, it's really better to do it. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. So on your, um, you know, support your weight on the, right. the forearm, right? Right. And it's a great and core exercise. That's one of the reasons I do it. And, um, and also just to kind of close it out, because a lot of people think vegans don't get enough protein or they're weak. And I will be holding one of my age group awards at a race and wearing a vegan shirt. Mm-hmm. And people come up to me all the time and go, I didn't know you could run on a vegan diet or... You know, you can't race on a vegan diet. I've actually had people say that. Well, the, the thing that's important that you should warn uh, potential vegans out there is that not everything, uh, put, for example, uh, people eat potato chip and they say it's, it's vegan. Right. So technically exactly. it is, but it is, it is uh, garbage and it's, uh, it's processed food. So. Right. We also need to be careful with, uh, you know, how to present uh, the vegan diet as well. I right, teach vegan. I teach vegan at the local uh, culinary school, and uh, I always tell them there's plenty of food out there, processed food, that are technically vegan. That doesn't make them healthy. Exactly. Mm-hmm. I mean, the classic example is Oreos are vegan, but. Right. Um, yeah, and we some people use the phrase whole foods, plant-based, and I like that, except the only problem with saying that is if you Google whole foods or plant-based diet, it comes up with like 20, rec- uh, 20 uh, ways of eating, 20 diets that include meat. So it's not mm. entirely accurate to say a plant-based diet, and you know, that doesn't really capture it either. Mm-hmm. So the word vegan means nothing with a mother or a face, but you know, if you say whole foods plant-based that really does capture it i think Mm. um because i also seen a lot of vegan overweight overweight vegans because they eat a lot of carbs a lot of uh, processed grains um and and junk food that is vegan technically but it's not healthy so we have to be very clear on that um because it says vegan in the box doesn't necessarily mean that it's healthy for you that's correct. And I always ask the questions of my clients, and I really promote this message in Paleo Vegan. What did our ancestors really eat? What did Mother Nature intend? And those, when you come up with the answers to that kind of a, a, a outlook, you really do, uh, it doesn't have to be rocket science. Right. And, you know, there are so many convenient Uh, convenience foods but they really aren't convenient if it sends you to the hospital and so many people will say well I don't have time to cook from scratch and I go you don't have time for diabetes heart disease and cancer those are real time wasters I grew up in hospitals watching all my relatives come to those and it's it's not fun it's just not yeah yeah Uh, uh, it's very difficult to convince people that I grew up in a convenient society to switch them to cooking. I mean, steaming anything takes five minutes. Saute, you know, two minutes. Um, Pan frying, grill, all of this takes only a few minutes. But it's probably because uh, the convenience factor, uh, also the fact that nobody ever taught them those basic techniques. So, uh, which leads us to your cooking class. What do you teach in your cooking class? Well, it depends on where I'm traveling and um, what people want, really. I've done them at health food stores, and so it's really up to me to pick a topic. Usually, I'll pick uh, a few recipes from one of my books and make that the topic. Um, So uh, I used to teach every week and sometimes every day. And at one point when we had funding and the classes were free, I was doing two classes every day, which was just insane. But now that I'm traveling so much, I don't do them on a regular uh, schedule. So it's just uh, per event that I do them at. Chicago Veggie Fest here in the States two weekends Mm -hmm. ago, they had 45,000 people come. I had to do cooking samples for 200 people for each of Mm -hmm. my demos and doing three different recipes for 45 minutes. So that's the kind of stuff that, that I'm really doing now is more of a right. demonstration. You know, it's funny. I do a radio show. I was just recorded for it this morning. 
and I try and extract all the difference. I have my Google alerts set for vegan, and I pull up all these news stories that have the word vegan in them. And one of them is some woman who graduated from Yale has come out with a frozen food line that is like these home delivery services that you pay like a fortune for to plop the food yeah. at your front door. This one, yeah. it's frozen, and it's by different ingredients. So when you get home, you know, for people who don't want to just cook it in the microwave and be done with it, you can actually just put it in a dish or several dishes and everything comes with it. So you don't really have to think or measure or do anything, but it's, right. it's exciting to see all these different platforms now where people are just trying to figure out how to get people to eat yeah. more healthfully. I see, I see that in my local grocery store. They do, um, they do pre-cut, pre-sliced, yes. pre-prepared oh. with the spices and everything right. in a package. It's in a refrigerated section. Right. I don't like for frozen food personally, and right. you know, just grab that. You throw it together, but you you still need a minimum of knowledge to put it together, and that's what I'm getting. Do you, do you just demo, or do you actually teach techniques? Um, I don't do too many things that are very complicated, just because at the events where I do these at, people are moving from event to event. You know, they want to stay and get the free food, of course, at the end. Right, but. Um, you know, I'll do a little bit of uh, technique, but the main thing I stress is just get a couple of really sharp knives that are fun to right. cut things with. And mm -hmm. if you don't want to do that, um, putting it in some cookware where you don't even have to use water. Um, it's just, uh, you know, it's got like a temperature gauge on the top. I mean, it, you just don't have to think very much to get right, this right. Up, uh, on mm -hmm. the table. In a hurry. And most of the recipes from my first book, Eat Vegan on $4 a Day, were developed when I was a, a single working mom. And all I wanted to do was to come home at the end of a long work day and get healthy food on the table for my three daughters. Right, right. Um, can we talk about a controversial subject? Um, soy. Soy and soy products, especially processed soy products. Uh, you know, there's phytonutrients and phytohormones in soy, which a lot of people uh, claim will will uh, potentially lead to breast cancer. Uh, what's your take on that, and what's your advice on uh, using soy? Uh, because people, I mean, some of my vegan students that that you know that's all they eat: is soy, this, soy that, soy burger, soy uh, everything. But if you like meat, like animal protein, if you do too much of anything, there will be consequences. Can you tell us your opinion on that? Well, you're absolutely right about doing too, too much. Um, the, phyto, uh, the phytochemicals in the soy burgers, like if you're eating those three times a day, there actually was one case of a guy who got man boobs because he ate way too much soy. It was like three times a day. Um, mm. But in the way I heard that was I just recently spoke and got to hear some other uh, speakers at the North American Vegetarian Summerfest, otherwise known as Summer Camp for Vegans. And I got to hear the very well-respected dietitians, uh, Ginny Messina and her husband, Mark Messina. And they talked about a study on soy that's just been released that shows that earlier in life you eat soy in its natural form. What is that? Edamame. Uh, tofu when it's non-GMO, it's organic, it's been minimally processed. Those two um, specifically, that the, the sooner you have it, the more often you eat it earlier in life, that breast cancer is hardly on the radar at all. So you can check out that study because this stuff is it's changing all the time. You know, my belief has always been um, when you understand there's no money in broccoli, then you know, there's no broccoli corporation, broccoli association, broccoli lobby. And when you mm. understand that, you got to be your own investigative reporter like I was to figure out what's mm. really true about food. I mean, I just want so that my three daughters don't get breast cancer. That's my only motivation in doing all this. But as far as breast cancer goes, uh, again, I think the studies are um, not as clear, depending which study you're looking at, and certainly check out, if you go to Jenny, uh, Virginia Messina's website, she has the links to some of these more recent studies that are not vilifying soy. I know you had Miyoko Skinner on your, your, pot, your, uh, your show not that mm -hmm. long ago, and she is Asian, and I once asked her the same question you just asked me, because I get this question all the time when I did cooking classes and in my audiences now, and she said, Ellen, 
the Asian cultures and others have grown up eating soy in its natural state forever. And our cancer rates are way less than in cultures where they don't have access to eating soy in its natural state. Right, right, right. But again, uh, their culture use a very, s compared to the Americans, uh, their culture typically eat less soy and typically it's fermented soy as a condiment. It's not the Edamame, yes, I agree. But on all, all the processed soy and out there, especially the highly processed that could turn uh, the soy itself toxic, not to mention uh, GMO. Uh, sorry, yeah. they, this is where I'm, I'm raising the flag. You know, I'm saying, okay, uh, we don't know enough about this. There's chances of hurting yourself by eating all these uh, soy processed products. Be careful. Yeah, I think, you know, as a former television investigative reporter um, and with my family history of breast cancer and being part of the breast cancer gene study, believe me, I was really looking at this. Um, but the phytoestrogen that is in uh, soy, and again, the Messinas uh, document this well in the research that they have compiled, it is not the same kind of estrogen that you take if you are on hormone replacement therapy or anything like that. Um, it's just, it's not the same kind of estrogen and it's, it's, it's well absorbed by your body if eaten in the right amounts and again, in its natural state. And we just keep right. coming back to that. What did mother nature intend? Um, right. So. Another, uh, another concern is uh, what if the mother cannot breastfeed and uh, instead use uh, soy-based formulas? Yeah, you know, it's better than using cow's milk because uh, there, there are just all kinds of reasons not to give a newborn baby cow's milk. Uh, I can tell you this now, this has nothing to do in my work with veganism, but as a La Leche League, a breastfeeding information and support organization, um, mammalian milk is very species-specific. And um, what that means is cow's milk, mama cow's milk is made to make a baby cow grow into a ginormous cow in a matter of weeks and months. And also there's research, by the way, that shows that it makes baby tumors grow into large tumors. Uh, it stimulates the production of estrogen, which may be why much of the breast cancer in my family is estrogen receptive. That's a whole nother, we could do a program on that. Um, but... Um, so mammalian, human mammalian milk has more sugar in it than any other mammal. And what that means is mother nature really wanted to make sure our babies would keep coming back for more. And so what happens is when a baby is weaned, we don't lose that sweet tooth. It's how we replace it that becomes the challenge of our lives. And mm -hmm. um, mother nature and in her infinite wisdom created a solution for that called fruits. So we can still enjoy satisfying the sweet tooth without the Oreo cookies, if you know what I mean. Right, you right. Know. So, uh, you know, I'm not, but I'm, I agree with you. Uh, uh, cow's milk is not appropriate, but so what would be a good choice so, uh, if know, the mother cannot breast? Yeah, you know, I have not looked at all the different options lately. I guess I'll just uh, maybe dance around it a little bit more and say there are very, very few reasons why a woman can't breastfeed. I was the woman who got the middle of the call night, uh, middle of the call phone call, middle of the night phone call saying my baby won't nurse, what can I do? And I would get in my car and drive over there and usually what was happening is the baby wasn't latching on correctly. And, you know, I'd just stick my pink, pinky finger in the baby's mouth, pull the lip down, and then breastfeeding happened. I was kept an extra day in the hospital because I had, I can't believe I'm saying this, cracked and bleeding nipples because my, ba my first baby wasn't nursing properly, and I didn't know how. In our culture, the, the reason La Leche League is so important, we don't see other mothers breastfeeding. We don't know how mm -hmm. to do it. And so... Right, right. So <laughs> keeping in mind that... In most, well, in the larger cities, there's access to alternative like leche. Uh, uh, we have that in Austin, but in like smaller town, it's not always available. So what would be a, a good alternative? You know, because I'm not a La Leche League leader, I haven't done that since the 1990s. I really don't know. I mean, soy often was the alternative, but I have, I mean, it, even then, 20, 30 years ago, we were kind of going like, ooh, please don't do this if you, unless you really have to. So, um, 
you know, oh, the other thing that uh, it, it was starting to be done then, and I think it's only gaining traction, is uh, human breast milk banks. And so um, you can pump your milk and put mm. it in, you know, in another, uh, in a bottle, and then, um, you know, that, that has worked. Right, so right. Wet, wet nurses have been around since the Bible. So that, right, you know, right. I guess yes. I'm just going to dance around it that way because I really don't yeah. know in this day and age if you can't breastfeed uh, what a good alternative is. Okay, okay. Mark? Well, you've given us a huge amount of uh, information, Ellen. Now, where can people find out more about it? Well, as I always tell people, I'm always on Facebook. <laughs> um, so Ellen Jaffe Jones, um, just I'm trying to consolidate all of my pages now because it's just I admin 12 different pages. So I'm on Twitter, Ellen Jaffe Jones, Instagram. I have a website, vegcoach.com, if you want to email me directly there. I have all my mm -hmm. books available there as well as Amazon. Okay, and I guess you're a, a Twitter fan as well and Instagram and all of that yeah, sort of yeah, stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right, right. Super Ellen, job. Ja Ellen Jaffe Jones, yes. Super <laughs> job. So I, mean, I want to go back really to um, what you were talking about, how there are a, a number of uh, vegetarians and vegans who uh, end up being fat and so forth. Now, I've got quite a few vegetarian and vegan friends. And the ones who are successful are the ones who have educated themselves about their particular diet. Would you say that's key and crucial? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and let me, let me just be real clear because I do so much talking in different venues between animal rights groups as well as health and fitness focus mm. groups. And the folks who are vegan for animal rights, I, they will often say this, I don't care if I'm fat if I avoid hurting an animal. So when you take that approach, that's kind of putting on the blinders a little bit and, you know, it's just feed me the Oreos kind of thing. And I'm not saying that that is the way everybody is, but to your point, um, this is what can happen. So uh, there are a lot of plant-based milks that are made from nuts and seeds, very calorie dense. And for me, sometimes I feel like if I look at a nut, I gain weight. And because I have had a weight problem and I have successfully taken it off with a good program called, if you just Google Mary's Mini, we won't get into it now, but that's the way I lost weight, basically using sweet potatoes as the bulk of my diet. So kind of like in the times of famine, when there was a, you know, people were only eating potatoes, you can lose weight that way. Also eating a lot of raw foods is a great way to lose weight, uh, as long as it doesn't glom on too many uh, nuts and seeds. So there are great ways to lose weight, um, pretty much on any diet, but you want to do it healthfully. And, you know, for me, the high meat-based protein diets worked in my 20s, but at the expense of my heart. And uh, it's just not worth it for a lot of people to have those kinds of issues. So, you know, just do the research, stick with the medical doctors who have been doing this for a long time, like Dr. Neil Barnard, Dr. John McDougall, Caldwell Esselstyn, Joel Kahn. He's my co-author on uh, vegan sex, the cardiologist. He has a great practice and a fabulous vegan restaurant in Detroit where he actually puts into practice what he's talking about. So just um, there are lots of great social media resources and stay with the people who've been doing this the longest and who are successful at it. You know, I keep running just to show that you can do it and also to keep the fire burning so that I can, oh my gosh, eat my carbs. <laughs> Not a lot. And we wanna make sure, you know, I'm sure you've all made this point, healthy carbs that take a long time to digest. We're not talking mainlining sugar, um, you know, and the refined carbs, the white rices, you know, all that. I'm sure you guys have gone over that a lot. Nice. So. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, well actually, to dive, to dive straight into that, there, there are obviously a lot of uh, foods that vegans and vegetarians can eat. Oh, yeah. But, but would, you, would you like to outline or mention three or four that they, they should stay clear of if possible? stay clear of um that are vegan um just anything with added sugar you know, read your labels um high fructose corn syrup ew uh you know that the beautiful thing about uh, eating a vegan diet is it includes all colors of the rainbow and so just look to colorful foods you know in the animal kingdom it's pretty much brown brown and brown so, uh, and if you barbecue it, it's black, black, and black. And then, you know, you've got heterocyclic amines, which can lead to cancer. So, um, you know, just 
eat outside because these colors really pop. Um, I'm just looking. Yeah, you know, all these different, I don't have actual foods here, but all of those colors come alive when you're in the sunlight. And it's Mother Nature's way of saying, eat me. Hmm. Sounds good. Sounds good. Well, I know we're all a bit pressed for time today, so I'm not going to keep you any longer. It's been fascinating hearing what you've been saying. And uh, Alan, I think unless you've got anything else you want to say, maybe we should head towards the close. It sounds so good. Thank you so much for having me. It's really been an honor and a pleasure to speak to you both. It's been a pleasure. And uh, for the record, you don't look at all your age. I'm really 95. Okay. <laughs> Thank we you. Won't. We won't tell anybody. Okay. So um, thank you again for being on the Low Carb Paleo Show. And as we say in Texas, a votre santé, y'all. <laughs> 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 <laughs>